went to the ozone layer. That would, would destroy it. <clears throat> so what happened was the military picked up the supersonic flights, and they've continued to destroy the ozone layer. And this was no They've been dumping lithium and barium out of uh, Churchill, Manitoba. They had a, a rocket program up there. And you know uh, when you go to the hospital or someplace and you have a tracer study? And they have, they inject something or you swallow something and it goes through you so they get a better picture. Well, they're doing this with the atmosphere. So they're dumping barium and lithium, both of which are highly toxic, into the atmosphere to see where it goes, to see where the force lines are, to see what will happen, you know, if you do this. During 1980, uh, 2,000 kilograms, or that's more than two tons of chemicals, were dumped every year. You know, and then we wonder, like, what happens to the crops? What happens to the people? I mean, this is rather incredible, and it was going on all the time. They now have closed the uh, Churchill, Manitoba site. But I was up in Alaska, and I saw all these boxes at the military site up in Alaska, Mark Churchill, Manitoba. So this was a U.S. military project out of Canada, which Canadians don't even know about. Now, these weapons uh, are not high in the sky. They're already developed. They've been developing them since about 1968. Uh, I was working at the time for the Environmental Protection Agency, and we got a, um, an environmental assessment to review, and it really blew my mind. Uh, I mean, all the things that they wanted to do, uh, and this was, um, you know, they wanted the, to build this platform in the sky, and it was uh, being sold as a solar energy project. This came out around 68 to 72 and the formation of OPEC, and everybody was saying oil's too expensive, and they, this was the government's solar energy project. They were going to beam down the energy from this space platform and convert it to electricity. Uh, that's when we started saying low-tech solar energy instead of high-tech solar energy because it was obviously a military program. It had all kinds of military possibilities. Anyway, the cost of it uh, was greater than twice the Department of Energy budget. This was the solar energy program. And it got voted down in Congress at that time. And when uh, President Reagan was elected, the same program came up as missile defense. They changed the name, and they picked up this side effect of being able to lock on an incoming missile and blow it up, and they called it Star Wars. This program dates to 68 at least, maybe before that even. But it, it's the same thing. It's the same program. And now it's Star... Uh, some, what do they call it now? Uh, uh, shield? Space Shield. It's the same thing again. Uh, you can read about it. I've put a lot of detail in my book, but I don't want to take the time now. But this is not new. And when these programs come up, you have to look at the funding because it was too expensive for Department of Energy, so they moved it into Department of Defense. They thought they could get more money. Okay, so look at the funding. Look at who's talking. Look at whether it's energy or defense, because military operates in both. This is what they want to do by 2010, and they passed this out from the Pentagon. So they want, uh, they want full spectrum dominance. That means the air, the water, the land, and the space. They want to dominate all of those. And space power is vital to what they want. And the next one, you'll see why they want it, which really, uh, uh, you know, is so blatant. They're not, uh, 
They're not taking care of the people of the United States of America. Look at what they want. They want to dominate for U.S. national interests and investments. Okay, this, is, uh, this is their own document. I'm not saying this about them. They're not even uh, abashed about, you know, saying this and mailing it out. You can uh, write to the Pentagon and they'll send you this booklet. Protection of commerce. This is the important thing. And we hear this now with Iraq. What are they trying to do? The economy, the politics, and subdue all the counterinsurgents. Uh, they don't care about the hospitals, the schools, the social needs, and uh, preserving the heritage of the Tigris Euphrates basin where you know our civilization started. You don't hear that. You know, listen, but listen carefully. So this is what's going on in Alaska. It's called the HARP Project, High Active Auroral Research Project, HARP. It's not the kind the angels use. <laughs> okay, it's in Gakona, Alaska, which is on the border of the Yukon in the, uh, in the Rockies. Halfway between Fairbanks and Anchorage, and the most beautiful highway and the most beautiful scenery that you've ever seen in your life. Anyway, this is an array of transmitters. They now have 48 built. They expect to put 150 up. And each one of those is a major transmission tower, and they're put 80 feet apart, and they call this an array. So they're five by eight now. They take up several acres, and by the time they get 150, it's going to be quite, quite a powerful, powerful point instrument. What they do is send up energy into the ionosphere and cause uh, its change, which then changes everything down below. They're also trying to create lenses in the ionosphere so that when they send energy up, it will come down on the Earth in a predictable area. Okay, they want to be able to, uh, what they say, deposit energy, which is like a big bomb, any place on the Earth. Uh, the other thing they can do is they send this energy up to the ionosphere. There's some will reflect back, and it's low, uh, extra low frequencies. And they go right through the center of the Earth and come out on the other side, and they can cause earthquakes and, you know, what have you, all kinds of havoc. Now, uh, you know, this is, this is built totally by U.S. Army and U.S. Navy, but it's called a research project, and they consider this their contribution to education. And they're studying the aurora borealis, in case you ask. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Now, in addition to the HARP facility, which also works together with, uh, there's other facilities at the Antarctic. There are facilities in the northern part of Norway. Uh, there's more than one up in Alaska. They can jointly act with others. And what they have done is set up a band of uh, what they call super darns, uh, super dual auroral research network, no, radar network, darn, D-A-R-N. Uh, and they uh, take two uh, looks at what happens in the troposphere as a level of life when they make a change up in the ionosphere. So they have these already set up, and they, what they're, these are all uh, monitored out of Johns Hopkins University in Baltimore, and they're uh, operating all the time, 24 hours. They're sending information into Johns Hopkins. So when HARP does something up in Alaska, these pick up what's happening on the Earth. So they're trying to learn how to manipulate the Earth system for purposes of war. Uh, if you think the weather's funny, so does everybody else in this world. 
You know, the weather is funny, very funny, and it's not just global warming. 